Thanks for coming today. I want to appreciate, I tell you, I appreciate everybody showing up um, right and early in the morning, at least for some folks in the middle of the morning for other folks and in the middle of the night for other people. And um, that's great. Actually, this is one of the things we're celebrating is our ability to have a, a global engagement with uh, Future as Workshops. Uh, that's one of the silver linings we've got in our current uh, COVID cloud. And so really briefly for folks who are, uh, this is your first time around on the Futurize train. The Futurize is um, a, it's a data store. So I'm just calling it a database because it's so different from traditional databases. It's funny to use the word traditional with databases because they haven't been long enough to really be a tradition, but a better word for it. So Futurize uh, stands for Functional Trait Resource for Environmental Studies. And the idea was uh, the gap that we saw in the landscape of science was that there wasn't a, a database that let, let you find specimen level uh, functional traits from organisms, measurements from individual organisms. If you wanted to find gene sequences from individual organisms, you could do that just fine. If you wanted to find species level average trait values, you could do that pretty well too. But finding the individual measurements like total body length, body mass, you know, um, uh, of course, I'm too early in the morning, um, you know, width of the orbit, things like that was difficult to find. Uh, and you'd have to do a lot of work finding them all yourself and then compiling them and cleaning them, et cetera, et cetera. We wanted to have a place where you could go like GenBank, but for measurements. That's something I needed for my research and I wanted to make it happen. And so did the rest of us on the PI team. So Futurize is at the specimen level. Um, it's measurable traits. So things that you can you know, put calipers or some other measurement tool onto a specimen and measure from, a, from an organism. Um, for the first round of funding, we had to limit it taxonomically. So we chose to focus on mammals, um, but we're hoping to expand that scope. And the real, the real trick here, the thing that, that we insisted on to make it work is that it has to be based on an ontology. So instead of being a relational database where you have uh, tables with defined fields and you'd have to create a new field for every new measurement that you added, um, Futurize is ontology based, which means that the data are encoded using uh, essentially subject verb object um, statements so that you can extend it to however many traits that you want to add and the computer can do the reasoning of seeing how different traits connect to one another because it has statements that tell it how the anatomy fits together. So in the end, you've actually got, um, we're building a much more complicated model of vertebrate anatomy in the computer. And if you were going to ask it something like, uh, I want measurements of total body length, well, it'll know what total body length means across different groups where people define it differently. It's defined differently in herps than it is in, in, in birds or mammals. And so um, you'll be able to pull those traits together rel relatively quickly without having to do the intellectual work of um, making the synonymies and trait definitions, because that work's already been done for you by the people who entered the traits and by the computer reasoning over the ontology, okay? So we had a series of objectives for the first grant, and I think we've actually hit them all. So um, we assembled a varied collection of trait data. It's actually pretty big now, and, and you can get access to it through our website, and we do have an API. Um, we've enhanced the existing trait anatomy and observation ontologies. So there were existing ontologies that have been primarily developed for uh, for work in biomedicine, uh, thinking about model organisms. And so we've been adding stuff to them to make them adaptable to work with all of the non-model organisms that we deal with. Uh, we've built a pipeline to associate the data to the ontology terms and convert to the RDF triples. So the RDF triples are the subject verb object statements that the computer uh, digests. Uh, we have the semantic data store and the API and web portal available so that you can kind of uh, go and find the data. Um, and then we've been conducting outreach to the paleontology, archaeology, and neontology communities. And this workshop is the last of those outreach events. Um, when we proposed the project, we had this plan of work, and uh, we mostly held up to it. Um, we had workshops planned for the summers in between each year of work that we did. And so the first workshop in 2019 was held according to our pre-COVID 
plans on site in Eugene. And uh, that was a plan to hold all three workshops on site here in Eugene, Oregon, which is a beautiful place. But when you have to pay for putting everybody in hotels and flying them, flying their actual bodies here to Oregon, it, it costs a lot of money. So we were extremely limited on the number of people who could participate. That all got blown up in 2020. And uh, we did our first completely virtual workshop. And we had such great participation that we decided that that was the way to go in the future. And, uh, and so here we are in year three uh, with the workshop three, and it's, it's a different kind of a beast. So here's the 2019 workshop. These are the people who were able to attend in person at the wonderful um, dinner we had at the Duck Family Farm. So for those who are um, more recently joining the team, uh, John Deck here in the center is one of the um, programmers who's written the structure that underlies Futrez, and he also operates an organic farm uh, here in the area around Eugene, Oregon, so we were able to actually bring everybody to the farm and have a pretty fancy dinner there. That was the plan to do every year, so that's one of the things you miss out on with the virtual uh, scenario, but I think there are a lot of benefits otherwise. And uh, what we had done in 2019 was actually have a, what we now call a hybrid modality, um, so we did have a mode for people to join virtually. Uh, it wasn't great uh, having people in person and virtually, as I'm sure some of you have done in your classes already too, is not an optimal way to deliver content or engage people in discussions. Um, so I think it's better to just go all virtual or all real, um, but maybe we'll find better ways to do it. Maybe folks have some insights on that too. Then last year we did a remote workshop and like I said, the participation was great. We had like three times as many people as could participate in the in-person workshop. And uh, we had a lot of really good ideas that shaped the writing of our grant proposal that we're about to put in uh, for the next uh, round of Futures funding. So that was really useful. And um, there were a lot of people with good ideas about research projects they'd like to pursue. And that kind of led us to when we were brainstorming for this year's workshop, we were thinking about, you know, let's 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 back completely up, and so instead of saying, let's take what we plan to do in person and just do it remotely, we don't have to do anything. We can just start completely from scratch. What what could we do with this remote modality since we're kind of locked into it? This was back in January, February when we're having to plan for now. Um, so we thought we would think outside the box. And uh, so instead of having the three days at once in August, like we had initially sketched out, we decided that we would spread the meetings out over several months. Because one of the things that we got from the previous workshops was that people had projects they really wanted to do and they really wanted to collaborate on, but there wasn't enough time in the workshops to get any work done. And it was difficult for people to find ways to get back together and coordinate the projects uh, after the three-day workshop was finished. So we thought we would create the structure for that. And that's what we're doing this year. Um, and so, you know, what I thought was kind of like Zephod Beeblebrox, if one head is good, two heads are better. If two arms are good, three arms are better. If one workshop's good, four workshops are better. So we're having four workshops instead of one workshop. And uh, that's sort of the Zephod Beeblebrox model of uh, Futures workshops that we're operating on now. So three projects, um, we, we had actually six projects proposed and we only have the resources to support three of them. So we selected the three that had the most engagement from people. Um, and we're gonna have one big party over four months trying to get those three projects to the point of having at least an outline of a paper and results that you can present in a slideshow. Um, the three projects that didn't get selected are all uh, still welcome to work on uh, in the future as context, then we'll support them uh, in, the, in terms of uh, um, like a working group instead of being a workshop subject. And the, the idea is that we're really limited in the number of people who have the training uh, to, to do the data ingestion, to model the traits into the ontology. And so um, the other projects we want to support, but they're going to have to be supported over a longer time frame so that we can try to get three of them uh, done over this uh, fall in the summer and, and the fall. And, and that's what I got for you right now. Okay, that's what I got right now. I think Kathy was, were you gonna pick up after me here and 
Yeah, uh, Edward, thanks. Let me just introduce myself for those of you who, who weren't on last year's call. Um, my name is Kathy Joyce. I'm a facilitator and meeting planner. Um, so I stepped in last year to kind of help make um, the transition from an in-person meeting to an online meeting. Um, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking today. Um, I'm just going to be kind of the master of ceremony, so to speak. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Megan, who's going to just give us a little bit of information about the, the different players and how, um, how the teams will be supported as we go through these next few meetings that Edward described. So Megan? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm sure most of you know us, but we do have some new faces. So I'll just kind of, for everyone, do a little quick introduction. So my name is Megan. I am now a PI on the grant. Actually, I started off as a postdoc on the grant. Um, and generally, I study vertebrates and body size. Um, and my role for this project has been to help create those terms that are needed and kind of synonymize terms across the Paleozoic and Neontological divide. Um, so I help with data ingest, I help with the term creation, um, help facilitate projects. And to help me, we have some people who aren't, they're coming in the afternoon. Um, one is Nika, a graduate student of Rob's. She loves coding, which is incredible. So she's done a lot to create functions to help get legacy data into Futures into a standardized template. And to help with that too, um, is Prasiddhi, who was formerly a high school student. Now she's an undergrad here at the university and she created an app to help with this. And we're really excited actually to try it out. So if people have data um, to contribute to these projects, we can use this app to help get the data standardized. Um, and then helping me this year and that last year as well um, was, is Helena, who has helped um, synonymize some of those terms and helped me figure out weird bone parts, uh, which has been really helpful. Um, the other people on the project is uh, John Deck, who we mentioned with all the dogs. Um, he really helps create the pipeline. And then I'll go in order from uh, oldest time period to newest time period. So we have Ray who studies horses. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know Ray um, on this call. Um, and he's contributed a ton of data and really helped lay the foundation for which traits we ingest. So a lot of it comes from Eisenman, um, Edward, who forgot to introduce himself, who's also a paleontologist and studies um, antler horns, antlers. Um, and he kind of is the big picture guy for the, the project, knows where we're going, has experience with databases in the past. Uh, Kitty, who does zooarchaeology, and she makes us think about things that we don't normally think about, which is fantastic. It's a whole new world for me, at least, um, and pushes us to include other taxa like turkeys. Um, and Rob, who's a neontologist, who I don't know what he studies, just everything, um, it seems, <laughs> um, but also um, has a lot of experience with these types of projects and helps with Edward, really helps drive this project along. And so we will be helping um, the projects by Nika, myself, and Helena. We'll be helping with the data, whatever data needs you have. If you have traits you want to add, if you have data you need to get in, um, we'll be popping around the different projects with that. Um, Kitty specifically will be popping around the different projects. So if you have questions or like, oh, I don't know how to do this or can Futurist help with that, Kitty um, can be there to help. And then we have all kind of also decided to sit on, in on different projects. So Edward will be sitting in on the allometry project, the allometry methods project. Rob will be sitting in on the intern interest specific um, a trait variation project, and then myself and Kitty will be sitting in on the mammal functional diversity project. So um, that's how we can support you. And if there's ways that I didn't mention for us to support you, please let me know. We're, you know, this is new for us. So whatever, we're very adaptable. All right. Great. Thanks, Megan. I'm going to turn it back to Edward just for uh, some brief comments about. Um, you know, some of the, the reporting that we're gonna need to do and some of the ways that we're gonna need to track the projects. And then later this afternoon when our small groups start working, um, we'll, we'll talk more specifically about that, but just as a kind of an overview. Edward, are you? Uh, yeah, are I'm, you I'm sorry, I like, uh, I forgot to pull out my notes. 
Okay, so um, one of the things that we're trying to do is satisfy the NSF's reporting requirements, which means that we need to have some documentation of what we do in these workshops. And so um, Kathy's actually put together a whole set of uh, forms and uh, uh, web, uh, web spreadsheets for the different groups to keep track of their progress on. Um, so we're hoping that everyone will be able to engage with those forms and get them back to us. Um, and so we have the, the different monthly workshops we're going to be doing. And we're going to have those as kind of a deadline to get the, the web forms done for that month. Uh, so that we can keep up with the uh, reporting requirements and just to help uh, folks keep track of the different parts of the projects that are going on because all the projects that people are working on are going to have a lot of different moving parts hard to keep track of. Um, so, so in the end, um, part of what we're doing, and this is not something we wrote into the original grant proposal, but we're doing it as part of the outside the box thinking, is we're trying to figure out how best we can support your collaborative uh, work, because this is something that we want to become part of the Futures continuum as we move forward. We want to do more of these kinds of workshops in the future and uh, use it as a kind of a, a crucible to get exciting, um, you know, functional morphology projects through to the publication stage or the grant proposal stage. Um, so that's, that's the point of the different um, forms. And I'm going to let Kathy kind of give us a rundown of the, of the details of what we're doing. We will. And Edward, you know what? I think um, I, I think what we'll do is because we're going to use all those this afternoon, I'll, when we get started after the break this afternoon, I'll go through all the forms so that everybody knows what we need to do um, right as they're going to use them. Okay. That sounds okay. great, Kathy. Um, I guess the last point I wanted to make was, uh, and this is something that, that working with Kathy on this project has helped me understand is that in all my training as a scientist, I got a lot of training in data analysis on anatomy and on the geologic time scale and sedimentology, but I didn't get a lot of training on how to organize people um, and how to keep collaborative projects going that have many different moving pieces. And so Kathy has actually introduced me to some of these tools. And I think they're really helpful. I'm going to be taking them away and using them in my own research projects. Not and this is part of my research project, but the other things that are not directly future as connected. And um, I'll be teaching some of these tools to my graduate students too, as part of their professional development. But I think this is actually a great opportunity for everyone to engage with uh, some of the tools that are available for doing this kind of uh, project tracking to help uh, improve their own collaborations. So that's another hope that we have coming out of this is that folks who, I mean, some of the folks here already have a lot of experience with uh, multimodal international collaborations and this will be old hat for them, but some folks here haven't had that experience yet. And so by laying all the cards out on the table and making it really explicit, uh, we can help get everybody those skills so that they can go forward and, and work some collaborations and help to keep track of really complicated projects as they unfold over time. So that's the last little nugget I, I wanted to pass on here. Great. Thanks, Edward. So let me just give a brief overview about the plan for the rest of the day, and then um, we'll, we'll get right into it. So the intention, and for those of you who saw an early version of the agenda, uh, there were a couple of requests for additional information to cover. So that's changed a little bit. Um, I think that there's, um, I, I think that Megan sent out a version later in the day yesterday, but just so that you know, we're gonna take a couple of minutes now to let each of the project leaders just spend a few minutes describing their project, answering questions, just so that everybody is aware of what all the teams will be working on. Then we're going to turn it over to Megan again. She's gonna spend a little bit of time just giving us kind of a, um, a review of using GitHub and the Our Shiny app. Again, planning questions and answers, whatever people need time for. We'll take a break at one o'clock Eastern time. So I guess that's 10 for those of you who are on the, on the West Coast. We'll take an hour break. And then the afternoon will be designed just to work in your small group. So we'll, we'll start as a big group. I'll just spend a few minutes walking you through some of the, the tools that you can use as a team. I'm partially to number one, start with setting some ground rules for how you'll work together and then developing um, kind of a work plan or a roadmap 
so that everybody's on the same page about how you intend to get the project accomplished. And we'll have tools to support all of that being done. When your team is finished in the afternoon, you're finished. We won't be coming back to the large group. Um, but what we do ask is that by the end of the day, in addition to developing your ground rules and your work plan um, and starting the work if you want to do that, but also that you have a plan so that everybody on your team is aware of what you're going to be doing over the next month until the next meeting on September 17th. So that's kind of the plan for the day. And I think with that, does anybody have any questions? Let's just stop there. Any questions or comments about anything that we've talked about already or about the, the plan, the agenda for the day? Anybody? No? Okay, that's good. And by the way, feel free to, you know, if, you're, if your camera's on, feel free to just raise your hand. And if it's not, then if you would use the, um, the you know, the, the little raise hand button so that, that we're aware of if somebody uh, has something to say, that would be helpful. All right, then I think what we want to do is move on to just these, um, you know, brief presentations about the projects. So we've got three of them. And do we have a volunteer from one of our project leaders to to go first? This is Danielle. I can go first if you oh, like, since I'll right. take the plunge. That would be great. Thank you. Um, do you want me to actually put up a PowerPoint or is it okay if I just speak verbally? You, I think you can do whatever, whatever you whatever you feel is best. All right. Um, I did put a presentation up in the folder that I gave at GSA in 2019. So I think if people want to see some detailed information about sort of how far I got with this project in the past, you can go look at that presentation. Um, so I probably don't need to sell everybody here on the value of measuring biodiversity, so I won't. Um, but basically, the project is based on the fact that there are a variety of metrics for measuring functional diversity, and there are a variety of traits that have been collected for extant mammals. And these include body mass, these include trophic level, um, these include um, more details on diet, they include things like locomotory mode and uh, beyond. Um, but of course, when we look to the fossil record, any of us who study fossil mammals knows that the majority of the fossil materials that we're going to get are going to be teeth. And so that obviously limits our ability to infer things like locomotor mode, except in a, a you know, a extant bracketing or phylogenetic context. And so this is where the question for the project derives, because there is this growing interest in understanding and measuring functional diversity in the fossil record as a means of understanding how functional diversity has responded to past climate change events, for example. Um, but again, coming back to the idea that some of these traits are impossible to get uh, with the current fossil record. And so the central question is, can we use body mass to reasonably approximate functional diversity in mammals? And, and so the approach that I'm thinking about using and that I started using back in 2019, and I honestly didn't get very far in the project, um, is a macroecological approach using modern mammals. And so um, the objectives will be to build basically a spatial um, understanding of what functional diversity looks like for modern mammals, um, incorporating a variety of traits that are available for fut through futurids and beyond, and comparing that to measuring functional diversity just using body mass and seeing if we can identify things like the same hotspots of functional diversity amongst the different trait data sets. And if we can, then I think we could reasonably assume that body mass tells us something um, or enough about functional diversity in the fossil record. Um, and I think that's probably where I'll end it. And uh, anybody who's in the group, we can chat details on all of that when we are uh, break off on our own. Great, thanks, Danny. Any uh, comments or questions from any, either either in in uh, in Danny's group or anybody else? Okay, all right, that's good. Who um, who would like to go next? I I could go next if you want. Okay, Noe, thank you. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. So I'm Noé de la Sancha. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm currently a um, faculty at Chicago State University. And I'm also a research associate at the Field Museum. Um, and so <clears throat> what we're proposing here in our project is to try to test various aspects of allometry. So allometry, as you probably all know, uh, there's at least three different types of allometry that are used in the literature for different uh, spatial and temporal scales. One of them would be ontogenic, static, and evolutionary allometries. These are measurements that are used uh, regularly across um, evolutionary and ecological literature to try to understand relationships of uh, various morphological traits, uh, in many ways, uh, understanding mass, which is uh, rather uh, overall uh, mass and overall uh, size of organisms, which are used all over the place. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that the uh, potentially the equation is uh, best used to understand allometries is what we would call a power function, right? Which would be uh, a log uh, of two variables to try to understand the relationship between those variables. Now, uh, I'm uh, an ecologist uh, in many ways by training. And when I was thinking about this, uh, I saw a parallel with many of the equations that are used, for example, for species area relationships. And in the uh, ecological literature, there's over 20, uh, 20 plus uh, equations that have been uh, proposed for understanding the relationship between uh, area and number of species that are found on islands or uh, habitat remnants and whatnot. And if you think about it, this is a perfect um, example of the same uh, statistical relationships for these two uh, variables. And what we're proposing is testing what is the best uh, approach to understand allometries uh, first of all, uh, is the power function the best way to uh, understand this relationship? Furthermore, are there other uh, better equations to understand that relationship? And then on top of that, it, are there universal uh, equations or are these taxa specific? And for this, we're going to try to use uh, the entire data set for uh, mammals. And we're going to try to understand what is the best fit function for various taxonomic groups to try to understand universal uh, relationships and then put it into both ec ecological and evolutionary context to see if these uh, relationships um, really are uh, uh, part of a bigger uh, rules of uh, life, so to speak. So uh, we have uh, the information there in the um, allometries um, folder. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I can elaborate more. Um, and obviously, it's still work. Uh, we're still working on this. We have some R code that we would like to share later today. So if there are any questions, I can try to answer those. Great. Thanks, Noe. Any, uh, any questions or comments? Okay, you're, you're saving all that for when you get into your small groups. That's fine. That's good. Um, so who is our last presenter? I think that's me. Okay, Brian, go ahead, please. Good to see everyone. Um, it's been a crazy morning here in North Carolina where I'm based. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Uh, my lab is, is mostly focused on um, ecology and evolution of, of mammals. We study rodents a lot and we study everything from uh, population genetics and phylogenetics to trade evolution to um, understanding kind of life history evolution um, using informatics data sets. So we, I think like to stay busy and, and span the, the range of kind of empirical um, foci in, in mammal ecology and evolution. But the project my group is going to work on is um, I envision it being decidedly non-empirical. So what we want to do is kind of cut to the heart of, I think what futures is about, which is how can um, interest specific or specimen level trait data inform our understanding of, of evolutionary process. And so um, we welcome people who um, are interested in making, I, you know, I'd love for us to make a contribution to 
um, the ecology community, the paleo community, the evolutionary community that kind of we can pin down um, how the use of intraspecific trait data really kind of heighten our understanding of, of processes. So I, I hope we can do um, a variety of things using some different types of data sets. I hope we can incorporate simulations to some extent or permutational analyses that are maybe based on real data, maybe that are in the futures data store or that a user has at their disposal, um, but kind of use that to ask a, a question about performance of methods um, and kind of impacts on inferences you might draw using different kinds of data. So um, some examples might be analysis of phylogenetic signal in traits, um, understanding modes of evolution or models um, of evolution on phylogenies. Um, thinking about assembly of communities using functional traits as, as um, the raw data, um, thinking about networks, interaction networks. There's some really interesting work um, thinking about um, evolution of ecological networks over phylogenies, but also um, just networks in general and their structure using species level versus individual level trait data. And um, often the results can be diff different from one another. So I, invest, I imagine our group kind of exploring those questions um, around performance of methods and impacts on, on process inferences and how specimen level data really kind of heighten that, that goal. So that's all I have here. Great, thank you, Brian. Any comments or questions? Okay. All right, so we are ahead of the agenda, which which is fine. I think we'll just keep moving forward and um, probably start the small group work before the break, um, which which is great. It'll give people more time to work or, you know, for those of you, I know some of you said you had um, meetings this afternoon, so we'll get as much in as we can before folks have to leave for that if you do. Um, so Megan, I'm going to turn it over to you if you're ready and um, We'll talk a little bit about the our shiny app and um, GitHub. Yeah, can definitely do that. I might start with GitHub um, because I told John and Prasidhi to come at nine <laughs> or news, um, so they might not be coming for a little while, and it's early for them. So I kind of doubt that they're checking their email quite so early in the day, um, and so I want to just say that this is definitely optional if people want to like tune out, get coffee, come back in like 15 minutes. That's also fine. But I had some requests for people who wanted their projects to be on GitHub um, for me to go over GitHub like I did at the last workshop. Um, so uh, what I'll do is I'll go over um, how to, what GitHub is, how to use it, and then also um, if you're the project leader, kind of how to maintain it, and then if you're a contributor to the project, how you would do that. Um, so I am going to get my computer ready to share and close all of my tabs. All right. Okay. So does um, everyone have a GitHub account? Just curious. Oops. I think I made one at some point. Great, because it might be helpful to kind of um, follow along. So I will um, share my screen really quick. All right, so first thing to do is if you have an account, sign in. You can see your profile. You can see all of your repositories that you have made. And then you can also see any organizations that you're a part of. So for example, I'm part of the Futures and I can have access to all the repositories and the Futures um, ecosystem. And so one that I contribute to a lot would be the data mapping um, as an example, but we can create um, a sample project. So I just kind of want to show you with a project that's already made um, most projects, or you should initiate projects with a README that just is to tell 
mostly yourself, what you're doing, because um, you collaborate with yourself more often than anyone else. And if you're like me, you think you'll remember in two days and you completely forget. Um, and then you can add files and it's just like a file structure that's on your computer. Um, some of the differences are you can talk to yourself or to other people using issues. This is how we communicate with the status of different data that we've been ingesting, like Amelia's data here. Um, and the other one that's a little bit different is something called um, branches. So you have your master folder, and then you can, it's almost like switching between computers or I don't know another good analogy, but if you create a branch, I'm so I'll actually go back to this. You can create branches. So you have your master, which is like your, your trunk, and then you can create a branch. And the nice thing about branches is then you don't mess up any of the original files and you can work um, on your own stuff. And then if you want to push it in, you can. And this is really important, especially when you're doing um, creating code. Um, so that way you don't um, overwrite someone else's code. And you can also see um, a version history, which is what's really nice. And you can always regress. So you can always go back. So like if the updated a readme file, if I was like, I don't like these changes, I can either change them or I can say, which version is this? I want to uh, uncommit and go back to a previous version, which is really nice. Um, thank you, Helena, for putting that in. Um, and so we can just create a sample um, repository. Um, sorry, every, all the chats and stuff are in my way. Okay. So what we can do is we can go to repositories and then we can say, let's create a new repository. So you can do that and I'm gonna call it test. And if you guys uh, need me to slow down, if you're following along, just let me know. Sample repository, public. Um, if you don't want anyone to have access, you can make it private. I tend to make all of mine public just because the chances that anyone's going to find your repository, how is it, Tori, I can spell, um, is pretty low. Um, and I always initiate with a readme file. So now we're going to create the repository. And so this is all online. Um, and then I also, in my file structure, do name. I create a folder called GitHub, and this is where all of my repositories live. So I can work on things locally, or they can be pushed up to the online. Um, and I tend to use a tool called GitHub Desktop. It's a little bit more user-friendly for those that don't know how to use the terminal quite yet. And so if I wanted to bring this repository from online to my local computer, I just open it with GitHub desktop, and I would put it in the repository that matches or the profile that matches. So you'll see that this is Meg bulk test. That means I want it in the folder Meg bulk. So if you're downloading a repository from a different um, group like Futures, or if your lab has a group, you'll want to make sure it matches. Otherwise, the file structure gets a little weird. And then we do what's called cloning. And then uh, probably the most important thing you always want to do is just always fetch the origin before you, you start. So that's saying, make everything on my local end reflect what's on online. And so we can do a couple, a couple things. So now if you look at your file structure, so here's my bulk, and now I have test. And there it is. And so we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to edit the readme file, sample repository, um, oops, and it all does our markdowns. So I'm adding text here. And then I, when I commit my changes, I like to say what um, I did, adding text, and then commit. And then I know there's a lot of steps to this, but it's almost the same as saying, save what I did. And so it says, 
I added text here. Now, if I go back to my local repository, you'll notice that the readme file, it's the same as this readme, doesn't have the I'm adding text here. So if we go to um, the desktop and we say, I want it to match. It says, okay, there's changes. Do you wanna pull them into your local repository? Yes, I do. And so now when I look, it now says I'm adding text here. So now it matches. Um, another thing we can do is create branches. Um, and this is really helpful, like I said, when you are maybe testing something out, trying something out, but you don't wanna change any of the files locally. So I'll say test one. I'm gonna create this new branch. And then you need to publish the branch. And then you'll see here, I can move to test one on here. And you can also create a branch here. You can say find or create branch and create test two. I'm going to create that. Oops, I just branched a branch anyway. Um, and then locally, if I fetch the origin, I can find test two. I'm going to stay on test one for now. And so what I can do is actually I'm going to make this the main. And so if I go to that readme file again, oh, I don't want to open up with that. Oops. I'm going to say adding second header, save that, close out. So this is adding second header. And again, um, on GitHub desktop, it'll say, oh, you need changes. Do you want to commit them? And if I don't commit them, if I go back to test, you'll see that it doesn't have the things that I added. I can say like, yes, adding header, commit it. And not only do I want it committed, but I want you to make it match what's online. And so then when this refreshes, I should say adding second header, but then you'll notice if I switch back to the main branch, there's no changes. And likewise, so here I have my second header on my test branch. If I now change this branch back to main, when I look, it's gone. So it's important to know where, where you are. So I made those text changes and I want them maybe put in with the master branch. So we do this thing called creating a pull request. And it's saying um, GitHub has automatic checks and it's saying you're not doing anything substantially different. I wanna say adding header to read read.md file, create pull request. And what's really nice about pull requests is if you're working on a big project, I can add someone to review. So you can have someone else, like maybe the project lead, review the changes that you did. Um, and I usually assign it to someone who's not me, um, but for this case, it's me. And I'm gonna say, go ahead and merge it. Let's confirm the merge. And so now when I fetch the origin, I'm gonna move back to the main branch. Now I see that it says adding second hender on the main branch. Um, and the other thing that's really nice about using GitHub, so in, in addition to maybe you're writing some code, but you don't want um, to affect the main script file. So you can, if you're writing code for one particular analysis, you can put it, um, you can create a branch. Um, and then once you know it works, you can push it in that's what uh, Nika Prasidhi and I do quite a bit. Um, the other nice thing is that as you come up with ideas, you can put them in the issues. And so you can kind of track your workflow and your thoughts. So you can say, hey, we haven't tested, like I can create a new issue now just to show you. If there was someone else on my team, I'll probably tag Nika. Um, test to do. Although you probably want to be more specific than that, but I can say at Nika. Oh, I forgot her, her name, but you can 
whatever her um, handle is. You can say, at Nika, I think we need to add a test case to the preview. And so submitted a new issue. I could assign it to her um, if she was part of this group. Um, and it's just a really nice way to um, uh, kind of communicate with each other um, instead of going through an email thread. You can have very specific issues. Oh, thanks, Nika. <laughs> um, and I can assign it to people too, but I'm the only one in this group. So for um, the other thing that you can do, um, the nice thing about GitHub is this, I mean, it's easy and it's hard to mess up. It's hard to mess up because you can always go back. It's easy to mess up because if you don't fetch the origin, then you get conflicts with what, um, where you are on the branch and you could be trying to merge older stuff into newer stuff if you haven't kept your branch up to date. Um, one of the things that you want to, so you can manage access so I can add people to any repository or team, which is nice. Oops, there it goes. Oops. So I can invite collaborators. And then you can always delete, and I actually have forgotten where that is, but you can always delete. And the nice thing that GitHub does is that it confirms with you many, many times um, that you actually want to delete it. Um, so we'll go back. And so if you wanna create a group, you're, I can invite you to the Futures team, or if you wanna create your own repository, you can add collaborators, or if you wanna create your own project because you're like, you know, um, I could imagine like for Brian's project, he's like, this is going to be, maybe have multiple things that come out of it. So I'm going to create an overlapping project with many repositories for each specific paper, maybe that comes out of it. And so you can create a new project. Um, and I don't really want to do this right now, but um, they're equivalent to like the features um, group where there's lots of people involved. And then I have repositories for every aspect of this big project. Are there any questions? Anything glaring or, or maybe, you're, oh, the one thing GitHub is not good at, and I highly, highly recommend not using it for this, is data. Do not store data on GitHub. It has limits in size. And if you sort your data differently, it's going to say you made huge changes um, and kind of freak you out, at least it freaks me out. Um, so I recommend having that data somewhere else. Uh, the Futures team uses Cyverse because there's a permanent public link that is usable and you can always call that link and get your data um, and not mess up the data. Um, or you can use you know, Google Drive or Dropbox, um, whatever you like. And I'm happy to show, show everyone Cyverse. Any other questions? Megan, um, do you recommend, you know, we create repos as part of the Futurist group or, I mean, is there something that, you know, the Futurist team wants us to do or do you no. care so much? No, I think the main thing that the, that we would want is just for it all to be available to everyone else. You know, mm -hmm. projects usually suffocate when someone has all the resources and no one can access them. Um, mm -hmm. So that would be the main thing. So using something like Dropbox, Google Drive, whatever you want. Um, it's just that I know I got from some of the project leaders um, a request to reshow this in case they wanted to use it. Yeah, no, I guess I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally great with using <laughs> GitHub. I think it's, it's more like GitHub on our, like do we, on our own account or GitHub, mm -hmm. you know, a repo nested within, the, oh. within Futurist. That's what I was. Oh, um, no, no preference. No preference, okay. just wherever people can access everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just if you're like, I don't know how to do this and I want, I don't want to mess up my own repositories. I want to mess up Futurists, you know, maybe do that. <laughs> um, all right. And unfortunately, John and Prasidhi aren't coming until nine um, or half an hour yet. So I can't, I don't really want to go over that too much. Why don't we why don't we take our break that we had on the on the agenda and we can take that break until 
what is it? Noon our time, nine yours. That'd be what, great. That'd be a good idea. Yeah. Breaks yeah. are always good. I mean, I mean, if folks want to, um, we could make breakout rooms uh, and have them just be free form breakout rooms where people can look and see who's in different ones and go have small group discussions too. If that seems, because I mean, one of the things that we're missing is that if we have a coffee break and the real thing, people would go stand around the coffee pot or people would gather in the corner of the room and stuff like that. So um, Megan, do you think you could make maybe like five breakout rooms and have them set up so people can join whichever room they want to. And then maybe I'll jump in one of them and the other PIs can jump in different ones and people can just come in and chat if they want to while we wait Yeah, for, should I create uh, five or should I create them? Um, right now, like five. I don't want to have like people line up in their three groups right now. I want okay. it to be more, yeah. All right, I'll just, I won't name them. I'll just keep them five. I'll one of them, coffee pot, we call them teapot. Yeah, I don't know. This, <laughs> They'll, they'll automatically number like just one through five. Yeah, I think it'll be faster if you don't name them. I'm being facetious. Yeah. Oh, too late. If you haven't figured out I'm facetious most of the time. <laughs> Probably my greatest weakness as a leader is that you can never be uh, sure when I'm telling the truth or just making a joke. Wow. <laughs> Um, one of the things I suggest to maybe Megan while you're um, while you're getting the room set up is you know if people need a quick bio break feel free to go ahead and take that. And then when you come back, um, you can just link into whichever whichever room you're assigned to. Mm -hmm. I know there's a couple of people in the chat who've asked if we could have a have a short break. So so basically we're taking a we're taking a short break and then we're just having some general discussion in the breakout rooms. Perfect. And I opened them all up. Can everyone see them? I think if you go to your little copy room breakout room on the bottom. Oh, they're making us choose between both coffee and tea and dogs and cats. That's why I gave nothing. Like, if you can't choose, <laughs> you just go. Or maybe I should have named it everything. But uh... <laughs> Okay, so go ahead and join your room, and then we'll, we'll close the rooms in a half hour for people to come back for the Art Shiny presentation. Hey, Jessica. <laughs> hey. I definitely have dogs if people want to see some. <laughs> <laughs> My dog is like, oh, you're moving around. Let me, uh, <laughs> I want to go follow. outside. Yes, that's well, exactly what Wynner do. He's like, you know, when I'm not moving around, he's totally fine on the couch. And the minute, like, I get up to use the restroom, he's like, oh, we're going out now. I know. Oh, yeah. That's how uh, I'm going to show. I'll also turn off mine. They're all it's so funny that you just said that they all just did the same thing. So I'm watching this pretty dog, uh -huh. and then oh, cute, what a little cattle dog, huh? Yeah, that's mine, and that's the back door. Oh, nice. So I, yeah, <laughs> like, okay, we're ready. Yeah, it's like I don't... you still have your collies. 
I have, yeah, I have, um, I have to get all my, I have my, well, this is my old guy. He's not a collie. He's, um, where is oh. he? Is. Rocco, he's 15 and a half years old. Holy moly. Um, wow. Yeah. But he's in pretty good shape. Um, yeah. yeah. He's just a mutt. Um, That's why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because then on the other hand, there's the border collie. Um, <laughs> the stance is perfect yeah. what did I do he's, he's only four and a half but he's the one who has the pretty I don't, I don't know if you know this he has yeah. severe epilepsy and it's uh I thought I was gonna have to put him down in June but he's hanging yeah. in there but, yeah That's good. We just, he has seizures about every two weeks so oh my gosh it's a lot. coming off the tail end of a he had seizures um Wednesday and Thursday so we're Oof. coming off that <laughs> Oof, that's so scary. stable now but yeah no but it's sort of every two week cycle so oh man yeah I think the my little one hey Sylvia hey Juan I think that hey. one is a a Sheltie collie mix mm. thing nice a tiny floof yeah. Mm. yeah we will be adopting a puppy in uh, some weeks so oh, that's so we'll exciting yeah and busy I wanted a dog but um but my mom never let me when I was a kid. And then now that uh, I have some space, I really decided to. What kind? You know? It's just a rescue dog. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That's amazing. Congrats. That's exciting. <laughs> Thanks. It's like um, my dog's typical. They just like to hang out in my backyard, <laughs> outside. How is Georgia doing? Georgia is good. I don't know where he is. Is that a cat? My cat. I was like, oh, I have you, have this, you have to switch rooms. <laughs> but who's who's the one who was having the seizures? Uh, Tayoga, the um, the border collie. Okay, how is he doing? I, uh, you know, he it's. I mean, it's stable, but stable hard because he has seizures every two weeks or so. So he's a. Oh, poor little ones. That guy. Um, oh. Yeah. But yeah, so he just had like four seizures over the last couple of days, three seizures the last couple of days. But I think he's sort of, he's on a, like a cycle, right? And so I, we just can't break him out of that two week, every two week cycle. Do they know the cause? No, it's, I mean, it's what they call it like idiopathic epilepsy. And so idiopathic means there's like not really a known cause. Mm -hmm. um, and he was sort of on a one month, cycle or he was actually holding steady and then the minute we had pandemic and like like literally the very first day of my stay at home like back in March 2020 he had his you know he had a bunch of seizures and then um he uh, since then has um you know sort of moved up to this every two weeks cycle I'm trying to look for my cat I was like you'll see my closet but there's my cat sort of Aww. <laughs> <laughs> just hanging out in the closet near my shoes <laughs> so sorry to introduce the cats to the dog room <laughs> must you must too yeah. they're part of the team yes well i don't have a dog but the reason i joined doggos is because my child my 18 month <laughs> child is in love with dogs <laughs> like he sees a dog and goes like doggy and he loves like being licked on his face which i don't know how i feel about that but i let do it it's like, yeah like, building up his immune system right i was going to yeah, say he, he probably goes, puts worse things in his mouth he goes like this you know and puts yeah. his mouth and like <laughs> smiles so i think yeah. the ever so i was like in honor to my son tomas i'm joining the doggos <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, how's Tomas doing? Oh, he is thriving. He is, <laughs> he's at daycare. We were a little bit hesitant to take him to daycare with the pandemic, but we were not working. <laughs> you know, like when he was a baby, it was really easy because I could work with I, him on my breast. Um, mm -hmm. It was like, you cry breast and then I could work and everything. But there was a point when that didn't work anymore and he wanted activity and he was walking and he was pulling my, my shirt. And I was like, I, I need to work, but I don't, you know. And so we made the decision of 
uh, going for daycare that had good COVID practices. And it was great. Um, he's gotten sick, but not with COVID, you know, he's had everything else. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and he's driving, he has best friends, and I don't know, yeah, it's like all you can Amazing. expect from. Does he remember their names? I remember my nieces went to daycare for the first time. They're like, yeah, we met people. What are their names? I don't know. Like- well, like, <laughs> he, he's, he's still like, he's 18 months old, so he's just saying a few words, mama, papa, agua. Um, and he's like really confused because we speak two different languages at home and then English at school, right? So he doesn't know what he's <laughs> like up to most of the time. He knows that like all done, you know, and then we have to say no, Jasta, which is in Catalan or like, ya estoy, which is, you know, like we try to like encourage him to, um, but like he's really confused. So names are like next level. Uh, yeah, like if I tell him, like, bring me a book, he will bring me a book. Or like, oh, give this to Dada, he will go and like, Papa, Papa, and like, we'll go, but he's still really, really young. Um, that makes sense. My friends who whose kids learn multiple languages, they understood quicker than they spoke. Oh, yeah, like, it surprises me every day when I tell him, like, bring me this, and he knows exactly, he's now obsessed with books. And he has his favorites. Um, so when he knows he has to see me, he brings me a book. That's amazing. Expectations. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> oh, what, what do you mean with this? You want me to read the book? He has a lot of dinosaur books for some reason. Oh, I don't know why, yeah. How would that yeah. happen? <laughs> and, but he has one about mammal diet too. Oh, nice. My, <laughs> yeah. um, I've been trying to like think about how to teach little ones because I have uh, a niece that's six, four, and then a nephew that's two. Um, and they have questions, but they get really shy in front of me. And then like, I try to explain like, well, what shape is a woolly mammoth? And they just like, they just could care less. And it breaks my heart. Cause I think at that age, I was like nose in the dirt, looking at rocks all the time. <laughs> yeah. If you talk to them about dinosaurs, they that might change their attitude. That's true. Maybe go yeah. away from sharks and woolly mammoths. Yes. <laughs> I thought I had good luck. I mean, the National Geographic kids, I think, had Ooh. just a ton of really good. Like, I just got my niece one on, like, astronomy. And she just, and some of it is, like, coincided with, um, one of the rovers, like, actually landing on Mars, I think. But, yeah. But in the book had been written, like, I think it had like just launched, but not yet landed. And so I, it happened to coincide when I was like up visiting them in Seattle and she had been reading this book and I was able to be like, oh, like this rover just landed and like show her pictures that was now taken. It was just sort of a cool little coincidence, but um, you know, not all of those National Geographic kids books they really loved, but a, f- a few of them just, you know, they need. I, at least my need, the older, my old, I mean, she's now 10, um, but really glommed onto them. And so it just, you know, you can't really predict. I just sort of like throw, <laughs> throw a bunch of stuff at them and, you Hope. know, some of it sticks and they love it. And some of it, you're just like, they're like, ah, you're just my weird aunt that gives me all this science theme stuff. Exactly. You know? <laughs> Growing up, I mean, with National Geographic, that was a major selling point for me because like my grandparents and I would spend summers with them and that's the whole reason why I got hooked I think Mm -hmm. is because uh, they had countless National Geographic magazines Mm -hmm. and I would just go through and like look at all the pictures yeah Mm -hmm. um, I would read them constantly that and Animal Planet um that was a big that was a big decision maker for Mm -hmm. me like that altered everything I think oh yeah Uh, yeah. do they still have animal planet Mm -hmm. okay it's a little bit more human um than usual than back in the day but yeah yeah Yeah. they still have it that's amazing yeah I do love all their pictures on that geo I think my grandma and I don't know how many of her grandchildren she still did this for but you know I'm like what 42 almost 43 and she's still um 
at some point she gave all of her grandkids um, annual subscriptions to National Geographic. That was like her, her, one of her, you know, her Christmas gift to us or something, maybe not all of them, but at least some of us. And to this day, this is still like she, I, I get the hard print National Geographic in my house and it is still like a gift to me from my grandmother. I mean, she's like 93 or 94. She's still alive, which is amazing, but um, it's That's sort of incredible. Funny. At some point, like five years ago, she's like, do you still want this? And I was like, yes. I mean, yeah. I'll pay for it now if you want me. She's like, no, 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 that's fine. But... <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. So do we, I know that I know most people, does everyone know each other? Should we do like little intros? Cause I realize we were maybe combining groups. Well, everyone knows me cause I introduced myself. Um, what I can do is I can like pick someone um, and then they can pick someone else. So I'll pick Sylvia. Hi, Megan. <laughs> Hi everyone. I am Sylvia Pineda Munoz. I am a visiting assistant professor and postdoc at Indiana University. Um, I work with mammal ecology, mammal paleontology, mammal paleoecology, mammal everything, really, um, and a lot of macroecology, too. And I don't have a dog, but my child loves dogs, and I'm honoring him, so. <laughs> All right, I'll pick the next person. Oh yeah, I have to pick the next person. So I'll pick Kyra is your name? Did I butcher it? <laughs> no, you're it's Kira, um, Kira. but <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> um, so I am a first year PhD student at the University of Kentucky. Um, I am involved in research with macroecology, urban ecology, um, looking at um, specifically mammals and urban ecology, but also like humans as well, trying to integrate a little bit more human ecology in conversations and things like that. Um, and I have a dog at home back in St. Augustine, Florida, not here with me in Kentucky. Um, so in a way I'm honoring um, my dog there. So yeah. Oh, that's great. Kira, are you one of Robbie's students? I am. I oh, am. nice. So Ravi and I did grad school together. That's amazing. Um, that's how I know him. And he said that he's going to um, push it out to some of his students. So I'm so glad. Um, yeah, he's a great, great researcher, as I'm sure you know. Yeah, he's so, amazing. Yeah. All right. Go ahead and pick, pick your next. Um, how about Juan? Hey, um, yeah, I'm Juan Carrillo. I'm currently a postdoc. Uh, in Switzerland. Uh, I have moved around a little bit. I was uh, recently in Paris, um, but then just moved to Switzerland for a, a, another postdoc. And um, yeah, I'm a paleobiologist. I work in, uh, today mostly in mammals, vertebrates, especially mammals, and uh, uh, mostly from the tropics. Um, uh, we do also a lot of field work. And, uh, as well as some analysis and uh, for my postdoc, I have been working on functional diversity. Uh, so I attended last workshop of the dress and I was kind, kind of like a, a, an eye on it. And then since I, when I saw this, I decided to join. I'll see how, how, I, how it works. I, I wanted to join also to the Becca room because I will not be able to, to, to continue for the next session because it's, almost six in the afternoon here. Uh, but uh, I'll try to, to join this Slack. I think that's usually a good resource and perhaps later on um, arrange or be able to, to attend the specific meetings for the project, but, um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's what I have to say at the moment. I'll pick then Jessica to follow. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jessica Blois. I'm a professor at the University of California in Merced, um, which nobody knows where it is, but it's about, well, Sylvia knows where it is because we're two hours west of Yosemite um, and <laughs> two hours east of the, the Pacific uh, Ocean and the Bay Area. Um, and so I'm a paleoecologist, a quaternary paleoecologist. Uh, I 
right now mostly focus on mammals. I've done some work with fossil pollen as well. Um, I, you know, do, I think a, a lot of different things. Um, you know, some genetics or molecular uh, ecology, maybe not ecology, but phylogenetics, um, some uh, isotope stuff, some morphological stuff, um, you know, sort of like dabble, I guess, in macroecology, lots of, dabble in lots of different places, um, to my detriment sometimes. Um, and I'm also a, sort of a, the associate chair of the Neotoma Paleoecology Database, which is another sort of occurrence database for um, uh, fossils from lots of different kinds of groups. But um, for the mammals, we generally have a lot of occurrence data, um, mainly at the assemblage level, some, sometimes at the specimen level for um, mammals, um, really from the, I mean, we have maybe some Miocene records or we're trying to do some Miocene records, um, but, but more recent for the most part. So, and so we're talking with um, Megan, Edward, Kitty um, on the sort of next iteration of the Futures uh, um, grant on how to link uh, trait data and um, specimen data and isotope data sort of by maybe linking, make, building better links between Neotoma and Futures. So, yeah, and uh, Noe. Hello folks, uh, I'm Noe de la Sancha. I am, uh, once again, I'm a research, uh, well, I'm a professor at Chicago State University uh, in the south side of Chicago. Uh, I'm also a research associate at the Field Museum uh, here in Chicago as well. Um, I'm, uh, I guess I'm, I'm primarily a mammologist. I work primarily on small mammals. And I apologize, there's jets going over Chicago right now. <laughs> there's spider jets. So um, they have like the air show today. And so it might get loud a little bit. So um, yeah, so as I was saying, uh, there's, uh, so I work with uh, mammals primarily. Uh, I'm an ecologist. I try, I uh, deal with questions dealing with the effects of uh, anthropogenic habitat change at various scales. Um, a lot of my work was field work that I did in South America, primarily in Paraguay. Uh, and then from there, we've started work in uh, West Africa. And now we started doing some work uh, here in Chicago, trying to potentially get into urban ecology, uh, hopefully. Uh, so I, yeah, I do a lot of work dealing with uh, ecology at various scales, uh, do some morphology because we had to, a little bit of taxonomy once again, because we had to, because we don't know much about neotropical mammals, uh, phylogenetics, uh, morphometrics, so on and so forth. So. Awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of people interested in urban ecology. So obviously Kira, Noe, um, and then Rob's group does a lot with that. He just had a paper that came out with Maggie Hantak at looking at Bergman's rule and like a heat island effect of urban environments, uh, which is pretty cool. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, and then I know that Robbie uh, and his group do a lot of stuff of basically bringing humans into the ecological equation and not allowing them to be outside of it since we clearly affect it. So, yeah, so that's exciting. And obviously, go mammals. Uh, <laughs> um, although, what am I talking about? I do sharks. But um, anyway, um, well, now that I made that awkward with the introductions, we can go back to talking about dogs, I guess. <laughs> it's good. I, it's nice to meet Juan and Kira. I haven't met you before. Yeah. Yeah, any, not to put you on the spot, Kira, but. Um, since it's your first year, but any ideas of like what you're excited about? Yeah, um, without a doubt. So um, me and Robbie have been looking at um, a couple of macroecology aspects with um, urban scaling. So looking at um, how density scales with city size and whether or not that um, really very like has variation throughout the entire world um, because we have this preconceived notion that um, we already know that density scales with city size in 
a linear fashion, but in various places around the world, um, there's sublinear and superlinear as well. Um, so we're just trying to understand that and understand the socioeconomic aspects of why this is happening um, differently um, past the westernized world. So that's one as one thing that we're like really um, jumping in on at the very beginning, um, something that I'm really interested in. And then we're trying to cultivate a squirrel project with urban and non-urban squirrels and looking at um, aspects such as that, um, going to collections, museum collections. And, and one of the things that we're really interested in is like this concept of urban heat island um, effects and how we're seeing a um, contradiction occur with larger um, yeah. sizes in urban areas, which is contrary to what we would predict. So very interesting things. Like we're, we're really starting off like with various different ideas. Yeah, yeah I did find uh, like Rob Grelnick's um, paper it's, yeah, not what you expect given Bergman's rule, although I think a lot of us, I don't know how everyone feels about Bergman's rule, but not a lot of good mechanisms <laughs> to yeah. describe that, or if it's even, it's not really um, widespread. There's a few animals that do it, but I think that everything goes out the window when you give them ad lib food. Like, Yeah, I was like, I haven't, what I haven't really seen is like, how does pro like how do you mm -hmm. how do you how does productivity play into the Bergman's rule equation? It right? has because to. It has to. Like that's what overrides in some ways. Like maybe maybe the Bergman's rule is like a general baseline null expectation if you hold everything else constant. But then how do you sort of fine tune that? And when when does it when does that baseline get overridden? And it seems yep. like it's overridden with productivity, right? With yeah. And that can come from humans like very, very strongly, but it could come from other things too. So it, I haven't really seen, I don't know, maybe I, I'm not really keeping up with the Bergman's rule literature, but that would be an interesting thing to try to like, how do you apart. sort of integrate productivity into your equations? Yeah, I think the two things that play into it, because you get it with the island rule, right? I think the mm -hmm. island yeah. rule shows the influence on Bergman's rule is also predator release. Um, which you have lots yeah. of places to hide in an urban environment that you don't, although it can't get too fat because you can't, you know. And you can't squeeze through the little. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Like, I don't know how New York rats live. Yeah, like. <laughs> honestly, honestly. Yeah, we, we, we started catching some massive rats in Chicago. Oh, some, of I bet. Like, <laughs> some of these things are like freaking guinea pigs, man. They're freaking... There's something you just grab, they're like massive. New food source. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I really like small mammals, but I have to say rats are just, I mean, I, I can get over it, but like they're not my favorite. <laughs> they're not as cute. Yeah. <laughs> I feel bad saying that because I like small mammals. I don't know. I saw in the news maybe a couple of months ago, they had like a infestation of rats. In Australia, it was not an urban one. It was the, the countryside. They had a video. I think it was the Guardian or one of these newspapers, and it looked like a nightmare. I mean, they had rats everywhere, like coming up from the bathroom, the sink, and uh, like to a point that you cannot really I'm, avoid I'm them to... any, any way. Is that Sorry. worse than cockroaches? I don't know. <laughs> like maybe. Um, not to cut it short now that we get on to stuff, but we do have um, three minutes. <laughs> so I think I might leave really quick to go get some more coffee and then be back. Yep. Yeah. All right. I, I, just, to, just to let you know, uh, uh, Megan, then I'll, I'll just write in the chat that I will not be, and then I'll write also in the, in the Slack group. And Perfect. Like yeah, one of the things that we hope to accomplish today is to plan our next workshops. Um, and so I'll make sure that they're cognizant that you're in a different time zone, a very different time zone. So maybe not to plan them silly. Yeah, anything. I, I understand it's quite difficult because it's such a widespread time zone. But we'll do our best. All right, I'll, yeah. I'll see you guys. Okay.
All right, folks, we're going to call everybody back in um, just a minute. So we'll get started in probably two minutes. That was fun. I, I hope it was uh, rewarding for other folks who went into breakout rooms too. Right, Megan, take it away. Yeah, just waiting. I just closed all the rooms, I hope. Um, so maybe I'll just make sure that everyone came back. It looks like there's still people in rooms. All right. Um, yes, I think that we will start with um, Prasiddhi, um, who helped um, create the app to help get legacy data kind of in our template and able to um, get into Futures. And a couple of things I want to say about that is the next stage of Futures is to try to hook, I think Jessica mentioned this in our breakout room, but hook in better with other data repositories that are around right now. That way people don't have to duplicate their work. And another thing I want to um, kind of emphasize is um, this app, we kind of hope to break. <laughs> so um, by breaking it with your data, it'll make it better. So it's not, it will not be perfect, but we want to start getting people to at least use it. So that way, you know, instead of the same five data sets that we have to break it, we can break it with new data sets. Um, so Prasiddhi, I'll let you, um, maybe do you want to share your screen? Can yeah. I take it away? Oh, and uh, maybe introduce yourself. I, I told oh, people about you, but <laughs> not entirely. Hi, um, hi, my name is Presidy. I'm a incoming freshman at the University of Arizona, um, studying computer science. And uh, yeah, so hold on, let me just get everything ready and then I'll share my screen. Yeah, Presidy has been working with us for a couple of years, helping make um, all of our little custom code more general and able for everyone to, to use. That's been great. All right, so um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so um, when you open up the app, this is the link, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, uh, you're, you're presented with this uh, data cleaning, uh, this like screen that says that only has data cleaning as a title. It, and then um, our readme is hyperlinked. So you can open that and then you'll find like all of our functions, what they do. And we have a couple of rules. Um, well, not rules, but like things that we would prefer to have followed just for all of the functions um, to work properly. Um, and then you're, it allows you to go in and select a CSV file. Um, it, it only lets you uh, import one CSV file at a time, though. So you go in, um, and then I'm going to demo with two CSV files. So for I'm going to start with this one first. But so this is uh, the Cougar data set, and it'll show up under data precleaning. Um, and then you can go in and select all the functions that you'd like applied. Uh, so starting off with the material sample type function. So with, for the material sample type function, it is required that you have a material sample type column in your data set uh, to like apply this function. Um, if you don't and you select it, it'll show up an error message under feedback uh, to tell you to, um, to, to tell you that your uh, data frame doesn't have the material sa sample type column and that the function requires it. But yeah, so you can go in, click, uh, check off whatever functions you want, and then it'll 
bring up a set of prompts that you have to answer. So these are the unique values found within the material sample type column. It's A, B, C, and lowercase c. And uh, we want to replace, and it asks us if we want to replace these, we're going to type in yes. Um, this function, um, and if, if you like input something that the function doesn't recognize, nothing will happen. Uh, and then it'll ask us what we want to replace A, B, and C with. So we can do whole or, uh, organism, or, organism, uh, partial organism, partial organism. And I know there's, there's like two C values, but you have to, um, write everything so that all of the values found within this uh, series are populated just for like ease of uh, running this uh, running this app. And then once you click that, you'll find that it'll update the data post cleaning. So we have whole organism, whole organism, partial organism, and uh, so on. And then we can apply these other columns as well. So the verbatim locality, um, and then uh, verbatim locality just combines the uh, all of the columns in the data frame that have to do with locality, and yeah. So you can type in uh, the column names which these are found under. Uh, if you like misspell something, it, it won't do anything. Like it, you can just retype it. So if I spelled management wrong. Um, So in this, I have management spelled wrong. And then if I click it, nothing will happen. You can, uh, yeah, so an error occurred uh, because there's no column called. There's, yeah, because management is spelled wrong. But once you go in and fix that, uh, everything goes back to normal. And you'll find the verbatim locality column. Uh, and then uh, we can we want to apply the sex column to, to the sex function to this data frame. And with that, um, the sex column is changed pre as previously. You can see that the sex column had F and M, but through this um, through this function, it'll change it to female and male. Um, and then if you have like unit conversions found within your data frame, it'll convert that as well. Um, in this in this version in this version of uh, this app, it, it will only recognize units that are already presented within columns that are labeled labeled weight and length. But um, hopefully, we can change that to be more dynamic in other versions. Uh, <clears throat> so you can go in um, in this in the data frame. The uh, weight measurements are already in grams and millimeters, so uh, we don't have to change anything. But it, let's say there were, uh, the weight measurements were in pounds, it'll change that under the weight column but it's not, so we'll just keep, leave it at grams. And uh, we also wanna apply the year collected uh, function and that will take the values in verbatim event date or previously labeled date, um, and then it'll change it to year collected. Uh, with that being said though, to correctly apply, to correctly have the um, date function, uh, the date, the year collected function applied, you do need to follow the rules that are set under the README. Uh, we we need it. We need all of the event dates to be set in year, month, day format for this to work properly. And uh, you can also check like the column names of your data frame to see which don't match our um, match our mapping file and which which column names are missing in accordance to our data and there's no country column in this data frame, so there's nothing to check within country validity, which goes in and sees if the countries within the country column are uh, genome accepted and uh, genome recognized countries. But you can click it anyways, and it'll show up under feedback that the country column was not found in your data frame. Um, and then again, as the column names function that I mentioned previously, it'll show up under feedback as well. And then material sample ID, it just creates a sample ID for um, our materials, our material sample type ones, uh, for our material sample type values, and it'll be found right here. And then we can also melt like uh, quantitative uh, measurements. So in this, okay, so in this uh, data frame, what we want, what we would like to melt are the weight 
and the length columns. And then you can click apply on that and it'll melt that into one row. So we have measurement type, weight, and then if you scroll to the very bottom, it'll show length as well. And then we have measurement values. Um, measurement values, what we do, what we do with this app is we just standardize everything into grams and millimeters. So from here, if you have selected like pounds or inches, your pounds and inches will be converted into grams and millimeters. So yeah, if it's if it's a weight value, it's in grams. If it's a length value, it's in millimeters. Um, and yeah, that's the full data frame. Uh, and with material sample type, again, if you don't have a material sample type function, it won't like, um, the, you can't apply that. Um, and now that I'm presenting this, I, I realized that there's a bunch of other functions that we need to change that to. So if, if you have a sex column in your data frame and you wanna apply this, it won't work if the sex, uh, if the sex column isn't with a capital S. Um, so hopefully we can fix that in later versions. Uh, but yeah, this is what we have for now. Thank you, Pacity. Yeah, luckily some of those are easy fixes. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, if we have any questions, uh, Jessica looks like you have one. I can't hear you. Yeah, I can't either. Oh no. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, I think that is so cool. So that is amazing. Um, yeah, I uh, just that's mainly what I wanted to say. <laughs> um, it would be, it seemed to me as you were going through it that there's almost like an order to some things, maybe or like, like doing the column check might be good before you go on to other, you know, and so it yeah. might be useful to think about that. But um, that's a good idea. Um, mm -hmm. And then Meg, I, you know, I, Megan's, you know, sort of streaming interpretation of what the different functions were was helpful and so you know maybe even adding that little like this just that shorthand i mean it's probably in the readme but the shorthand this is what the this is what this function did um i guess my one question is i saw you could export the clean csv file yes um are you able in the end to export um like a log of the code and the transformations that were applied because that might be really useful for like for me like I can go and I can do this app you know use this app to do that but I'm also really interested in seeing specifically what the code uh, like the functions were underlying that just so I can learn but also mm -hmm. as a check yeah. that so cool. something really cool about Streamlit which was the what we use to build this app it's i think it's still in the beta version but um it it, it worked pretty well for this so yeah. you can go you can go in and you can click manage app and it'll show like everything that's been done um, in the process of cleaning your data frame cool um it, it, it's i don't know to me it feels like a little much but it, it's really cool and it, it'll let you see everything so like with the sex column uh, female is true. It goes to female. If and the um, if, mm -hmm. if 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 male is true, it goes. It'll go to male mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Uh, I, I haven't gotten a chance to look at this fully, but I know that this is available. Um, and then it it also has like all the packages that were installed and all of that. Yeah, awesome. it does. It does seem like it's missing a couple things, but yeah, I'm not really sure entirely how this works. But that's a great point since we have the feedback maybe we could create a log type thing um just to export so that's a great idea so yeah. i know other things do that like um our refine does that as well so. and then from here the idea is that um it can go into we use geom as an intermediate um and so this way you don't keep getting hopefully it reduces the number of times that people get kicked back from geom because the data isn't exactly right and then GM is where we store all of the individual data sets and then pull that through um, to the Futures data portal, um, which we'll go to next, but I wanna make sure that there aren't any more questions or comments for ways to improve, um, or if you think about them later, feel free to message as well. The app. All right, if there is nothing um, 
for Pasadhi. Um, we'll move on to John, who goes into the next bit. So once all the data is in the correct template, um, and hopefully um, without too much pain, <laughs> um, it'll be pulled through to the, the data store. And I'll have John explain that. Thank you so much, Pasadhi. Hello. Hey, um, Megan, how much time do I have? Um, like 15 minutes, I think is what we allotted. Although, oh, yeah. John, we're, we're a little ahead of schedule. So if you need some more time, absolutely go ahead and take it. Um, like to show the, the dogs. Um, okay, so that's yeah. Yeah, the first. <laughs> <laughs> For example. That's the first, the first order of business is puppies. And unfortunately, all the puppies are gone. They all, they all found homes. Um, they're not here. We're just left with photos. So apologies about that. Um, okay, so I'm going to go through really quick, following up with what that great presentation that Presidi gave about data cleaning. And I'll just share my screen. Uh, let's see here. Okay, and then I'm minimizing the chat window. So if there's if there's questions, you can type them via chat and then Megan, you can just ask me um, and just interrupt as we go. Um, so can you see my screen here? Yes. Yeah. Awesome, great. Um, so I'm just gonna jump real quick into Geome. Um, and so here's the ad, the addresses in the upper left, geome-db.org and there's, on the, on the Futures homepage, there is um, under the data tutorial, um, there's information about how to um, upload data into Geom. Um, but just real quickly, that there is a, um, we have what's called a team. And if you, if you go in to Geom and you want to create a user account up here in the upper left-hand corner, you can create an account. I've already created one called JDAC. And if I wanted to create a project, you know, I can just squirrels of Scandinavia. That's always my favorite thing. Um, and then you select join a team workspace and you can select futures. And then you click create a project. And then from here, um, you could either generate a template. If you've already uh, generated a template through Proceedings tool, and you have your data sorted already, you can choose to just load data and you would browse. You could either say it's in an Excel workbook or it's in a CSV file. Um, and the idea is that once you, you go through this, this will, GM will walk through. Most of your data should validate if you use Proceedings tool. Um, it'll, it might prompt you for some um, you know, additional things you might have to fix, but then once you upload it into GM, um, we can navigate to the teams that'll show up here. If I look at the futures team, there's some projects already that have gone through um, and uh, you'll see Squirrels of Scandinavia, which I just created here. Um, there's uh, zero samples. I, I made this as JDAC and it's private and I'm, and I'm seeing it now because I'm logged in as JDAC. But if you have, a, if you have something that is private, um, it's not gonna show, it'll only show to you when you look at this template. Uh, or when you look at the, the team view here. Um, if you make a public, anybody in the world who clicks on view teams, you'll be able to see this, um, see the data. So there are some data sets that are, that are already here. Um, so I'm gonna move on. Some of these data sets, uh, the ones that are made public um, are indexed. Um, and if we go to, um, there's, a, there's a long pipeline and I don't have time to explain this um, or to go through all the bits, but once the data goes into Geom, um, there's a Python code that pulls all this data out, processes it, um, it converts it into RDF triples, and then there's reasoning um, that happens using our um, ontology for, for vertebrate traits. Um, and it maps all of the measurement type terms and all the other terms for events and samples um, and observations and measurements all get converted into ontology land. Um, and there's uh, reasoning. So we can reason on um, superclass relationships, um, which are then asserted and then put into an Elasticsearch database. So 
Um, this, what you're looking at now is our future search engine. Um, and let me just go back and I'll, when you're on the futures webpage, if you go to futures first and then click on query on the upper right hand corner, um, it'll pull up here. Um, so I'll, I'll point down here. These are the list of public projects. We have VertNet, um, which is kind of its own deal. Um, and then we have these other projects here. So if, if I click on say this uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Puma data set, um, it'll, you'll notice that the rest of the fields categories up here will winnow down and it'll show you that well. In this particular data set, there's 13,208 pumas. Um, it'll show you how many males and how many females there are um, in all the different countries. And this all checks out because it's all, you know, for instance, it's in the state of Oregon, so they're all gonna be in the USA. Um, and you can like bring this down a little further and just check just the males. So this is kind of a good way to kind of explore kind of what has been loaded. Um, now I have, I left males checked. Now we look at all the different projects that have, you know, the male field filled out. So now VertNet, it was um, 2.5 million or something. So now there's 1.3 million um, records in VertNet here that satisfy that criteria. And so if you wanted to look at, you know, VertNet, for instance, um, it shows, you know, here's all the different countries that are in VertNet that, that are sex males. So this is just a kind of a cool way to explore the data. If you want, you could um, click download um, and download should work on both PCs and Macs the same now. Um, it just downloads a zip file. Um, and this might take a little while. Generally, it works better uh, if you have, and actually there is a limit of 100,000 records through this interface because it takes a little while to format the results. Um, and this one, you know, so the more the, the, the more you can constrain your query, um, the better it's going to be. Um, and of course, since it's a demonstration and I click download, it's just sitting there spinning. Um, but we could actually, I could use this this time now if folks have any questions. Any questions? There we go. Took a little while. Um, John, there's a question. We have, we have a zip file. Um, and if you click your zip file in your downloads folder, you open it up. They, it gives you three different files. There's a, there's a readme, which kind of describes what we just looked at, um, a citation and data use policy, and then a data.csv. Um, so you can see this is, you know, this is an 18 megabyte file um, that you just fetched with our query parameters that we had here. Go, go ahead, Kathy. We... Uh, yeah, John, I just, um, uh, Noe, or somebody, at, yeah, it was Noe. Um, can we query more than one trait at a time? Um, right now, no. So the trait, the traits, when we look at this, um, is just winnowing down. Um, you can't select, for instance, you know, body mass and long bone length together. You would just click one. Um, so it does show you like when you query these things, like if I click on body mass, it shows you weight as well. So we're querying, since weight is a super class of body mass, it does query that. Um, so in that sense, you know, you can, um, you know, so for instance, tibia length, again, it's a, we get a we get a long bone length and a length, um, so it's not like you have to query all three of those. It's just that you select the the most appropriate level. Um, we could that would be kind of like another interface if if there were multiple traits that were not um, children, you know, or maybe there were like I guess siblings. I guess is what you'd be after. Um, but then in that case, you could query, for instance, like all you could just select long bone length. If I selected long bone length, I get tibia length, humerus length, and femur length. So I just queried, you know, three different, or actually I queried five different traits, all length, all long bone lengths, femur, humerus length, and tibia length, which are 
these these three are are children of the long bone. So uh, the answer to that question is yes and no. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Like mass Any and tail length. For the, oh, I see, for the, oh, I see. Yeah. Um, I think we would wanna query, like for the same sample, you could query all traits for a sample. Yeah, but not um, a particular sample and this trait and that trait, yeah. Um, okay, so I'm looking at the chats. Are there other next steps for improvements? Yes, so there's a bunch of stuff that we've been talking about. Um, so we've been talking about putting together um, the next, like a futures proposal, futures two. Um, one of the things that we are talking about is um, uh, linking back to source data sets. So right now we don't we don't link back, but um, since we're talking about observations and measurements, these each individual observation is not the same thing exactly as a sample. So when you click on something, we want to get back to um, either VertNet or we've been talking about going back to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility and using that as a way to broker data sets. And so we kind of had a long conversation about this and we decided that that would be something we put into the Futures 2 grant. Um, the other part of this that I want to implement um, is a map view. So we had an old interface that had a map view and this new, new interface, um, I didn't have time to structure, um, you know, so you could look at how these were, um, your results were um, distributed geographically. So that's another improvement that we're proposing to put into the Futures 2 grant as well. Other other questions for John? I just want to reiterate um, if anyone has like ideas of like how you would use this or improvements we can make, feel free to message us. We're very open and really want to improve it. Yeah, and it's good to get um it's good to get feedback from a lot of different users to see if there's any, um, you know, platforms or browsers that might behave differently than other things. Um, and then other, you know, of course, feature requests were a little bit limited, um, just like where we're at now, but I think it's really great to get these feature requests for like, as we're looking forward to the future, um, we have a set of things. The, these are things that users are interested in. Um, so you can just email, um, Megan or myself. Or futures.team. Cool. All right. Um, so any other questions on anything that we've talked about so far? Do people have sort of a general sense of how this all fits together and how it will fit in with the projects that you're gonna be working on? I mean, this is the opportunity to sort of talk through any any of that that you might want to talk through with, you know, while John's here and Presidi and others. Anything? Okay. So my proposal then, let's see if this works. We're um, we're scheduled to take kind of a longer break of a lunch break or you know whatever in a half hour and then to start working with the small groups my suggestion is that we go ahead now and do the instructions for the small groups and then people can take the break and then when we come back you can just go ahead and get started does that edward does that sound okay to you and everybody else yeah i think that sounds great okay all right very good thanks kitty okay so um let me I'm gonna share my screen. So essentially what I want to present are the instructions for the things that you need to work on this afternoon, as well as a little bit of information about the uh, reporting information that, that you'll be collecting each month. 
All right, so give me one second here. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, so um, the first thing that we're going to ask you to do when you get together this afternoon is to set some ground rules for your team. And I guess the very first thing is make sure that everybody on the team um, knows one another. So take a few minutes to introduce yourselves, um, to talk about you know who you are and where you're from and the kind of work that you're doing. And I think it would be useful for everybody just to um, explain why they're interested in being on this particular team. What is it about this project that really interested you to make you want to sign up for it? Once you've had an opportunity to do that, what we want you to do is set up some ground rules for your team. And I know that many of you are probably kind of chomping at the bit, like we just want to get into the science, we want to start talking about that. I, I get that. But I also think that if you don't take a few minutes to really set up the infrastructure for your team, specifically ground rules and a work plan, I think it becomes much more difficult later on when you run into difficulties. So, you know, if you set it up up front, I think it makes it much easier for people to just work together in the long run. So when we talk about ground rules, you know, I, I would suggest that what, what you're looking at are the, the kinds of values or agreements that the team will operate by. And I think it's important, which is why it's scheduled in this meeting today, that everybody on the team has an opportunity to participate in this. This isn't something that the team leader just writes down and says, okay, here we go. This is something that the team develops together. And I think once you've developed those, what you wanna do is agree on a place that they'll be posted, that everybody can take a look at them and to get some agreement that everybody says, yes, for the time that we're working together as a team, you know, I, I agree that, that will abide by these ground rules. And we'll talk in a minute about some ways to, to set those up pretty effectively. But I just, I've got a list here, I won't read them to you, but you can just take a look at these, at sort of some sample ground rules. So I think what, what you wanna to try to get at is, you know, how are we going to work together as a team? Um, you know, what are everybody's commitments and how do we, you know, what happens if people don't meet their commitments? How are we gonna work? together on that as a team. Um, you know, this one that I have about sharing responsibility for the project successes and shortcomings, I think it's important that we, you know, there's some commitment to, um, you know, we're all responsible for what the team does. I think, you know, to think about how we are going to communicate um, and, you know, what are the rules about how much work everybody's doing and what happens, you know, if you can't complete it on time, what, what works for people to be able to do that? Yeah, Danny, do you have a, a question? Yeah, sorry, I might be jumping the gun. This might be coming up on the next slide and I apologize if oh, it does. But one thing that uh, pops into mind is authorship as well. And the way that we've done it in other working groups may not be the way that other people have done it. Um, but typically we have, you know, the few people who have done the bulk of the work and then everybody else is sort of alphabetical or something like that. So it might be worth considering and laying that out at the beginning so that there's no, uh, you know, conflicts at the end. Um, yes, I absolutely agree, Danny. That I, I think that's an important thing to talk about. And one of the things that, if, you know, if you go back to the very beginning and some of the information that you got about, you know, even participating in this project, was the concept that you know everybody who does their fair share of the work gets to be an author on the paper. So I. I think, you know, there's a couple of things there. One is, you know, how do you lay out authorship, but also what does fair share of the work mean? And so I think to have a conversation about that so that everybody's on the same page will be really important. The way we've worked it in other um, working groups is that anybody who participates in the discussion who is there is automatically an author because um, there are, you know, there are differences in people's perceptions on how much they feel they contributed, right? So, but I mean, and maybe this is, maybe not everybody will agree with me on that kind of rule, but. Right, and I think it's, I, I think the bottom line is for your team to talk about it and find a way that everybody, you know, can live with the decision. Everybody might not feel like I'm 100% on board, but you want consensus that says we can all live with this and then get that commitment and move forward. You don't wanna to have to keep revisiting it either, right? So, good, all right. So then um, my suggestion for how to develop these ground rules 
is to start with each person on your team writing down, you know, a few things, one or two or three that they think are really most important for the team to adopt in working together. So this is the first thing that we're going to ask you to do this afternoon after you introduce yourselves and just get to know each other a little bit is to step back and write down, you know, one or two or three ground rules and then have each person share those. And my suggestion is, you know, do it on a Google Doc or a Jamboard, whatever works for the team to work together. Um, but what you want is for, you know, to get those all posted and then start talking about them and, you know, add, delete, combine, you know, set up some categories so that you end up with a list of, you know, fewer than 10. I, you know, six to eight is probably good. Um, but, you know, enough that people can sort of remember them um, that everybody can agree on or at least have consensus about. And once you've gotten to the point that you agree about that, um, then, you know, finalize and post that list where everybody can access it, right? So again, it's sort of building this, you know, how we're going to work together. I think this is really useful when down the road, as inevitably happens, you know, something comes up and people can go back to this and say, well, wait a minute, you know, what we all agreed to was X and it's there in the ground rules. You've all talked about it. Um, and so I think having a place that people can be reminded about these and they can look at them when they want to is really important. Um, I'll stop there for a minute. Any questions about the ground rules or this, this process that you, can, that you can go through to develop these this afternoon? Kathy, there's, there's one in the chat. <clears throat> oh, okay. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have the chat on my screen. Let me, uh, let me get there. Hold on a sec. I think I have this. I can just, right. I can speak up and say, I just wanted to know if the slides will be available for us because um, I think they're really useful. Um, I'm going to forget something about the process once I'm in the breakout room after a break. And so yes. knowing where you to go what? for that. That's a great point. So I will, um, I will put the link in the chat. And um, then, yes, they'll be available to everybody. And I think my other comment, um, and this goes back to Danny's comment about authorship is, um, and I wrote this also, is knowing whether the futures leadership team has any guidelines that we should know about, right? Like, I don't know if you have discussed within your leadership expectations that you've set for the group. Um, you know, and, and I mean, in, to some extent, all of the PIs are also, um, you know, have put in a lot of effort onto each of our individual projects, but you're not going to be in the room, right, when we're sort of discussing authorship, but yet, like John and Megan and, you know, and Kitty and, you know, all of your contributions feed into and enable our work. And so it'd be just nice to maybe, you know, how we need to, or we should be considering those contributions. So. Hey, hey Jess, that's a really great question. This, hi, everyone. This is Rob. I guess the features team, I won't speak for for Edward or or anyone else, but um from a personal perspective, like our our sense is that we're able to, we're our goal is to enable like these conversations and these projects to happen. And I don't think that we necessarily directly see building infrastructure as um and building resources for people to build on top of as requiring authorship in any form, unless we're also directly involved in the intellectual contributions in the groups all the way through. And so we would be under the same rules and, um, and be in the same kind of mix as anybody on a team if we're, if we're able to make that commitment. But I don't think we were expecting to have an authorship on anything that's produced out of these teams unless we're able to like live by our own rules. Um, I don't know, Edward or Kitty or anyone else want to jump in here? I, I, agree. With you, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. We, we didn't want to, yeah, we want this to be kind of a grassroots thing. One of the things I've seen happen over and over again is uh, informatics projects fail when they try to have too much top down control and they succeed when there's a lot of bottom up effort to support it and engage with it. So, what we really want to do is create the space for research teams to organically organize. And then, you know, we're going to participate as we can uh, in the projects that we're most excited about. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that we um, expect to have any special uh, special status within those projects. Yeah, that's how I, that's how I look at it. 
Can I also add one point to it? It sounds like we're we're suggesting you'll be able to think of everything today right at the start, but I think you should consider these ground rules as something that you build on as you move along through your project. You'll come up with you know, new situations you'll want to add to them. And as much as you can, because <clears throat> I know that people have different obligations. So sometimes your your group of people at the workshop or at whatever meeting you're doing will will vary a little bit, but try to keep your entire team um, on board with whatever new new idea you need to incorporate as you're going along. And I don't know, um, I'm presuming, Kathy, that there's a way, is there, well, I'm not, I shouldn't presume anything. Would it make sense for all the teams to be able to see everybody else's ground rules? Is there a place we can put these? Because often one group will have a wonderful idea that the other group didn't think of. Uh, yes, actually we can do that. Um, so there is a set of documents for each of the each of your projects. There's a set of documents that um, I'll, I'll show you in just a minute. Actually, we'll link into those. So um, it's it's you know the, your reporting form and your work plan, and I think it makes great sense to just um, in whatever format you're developing it to go ahead and put your um, the ground rules there too, and then the other teams can take a look at them. Yeah, that's a great thought, Kitty. The other thing that I just want to build on, Kitty, what you said is that it's you know you're right that these should be living documents. These should be something that you revisit. Um, and say, you know, is this still serving us? Are we still, you know, in agreement that this is how we want to move forward? The other thing that I'd suggest is that periodically after you meet, just to go back to the ground rules and, you know, have the team look at them and say, what did we do well and what could we do better? Really, you know, to, to sort of be focusing on not just the science, but how are we doing as a team? And are we really following what, what we agreed to follow? So that I think that's a way to sort of keep the team on track and remembering the ground rules as well. All right, other uh, comments or questions about the ground rules? Okay, so I will put the link to the slides um, in the chat. And as you'll see, there's a couple other things that I think will be helpful about those as well. Okay, so in addition to the ground rules, we wanna talk a little bit about reporting. And again, I wanna be really clear that these you know, these reports are not because somebody wants to be looking over your shoulder to micromanage your project. I mean, these are really about being able to um, sort of keep track of how things are going and, and to be able to go back and summarize some of how the project went through this, which are hopefully pretty easy and basic um, uh, forms. So, so basically, you know, what we want to know is, you know, in light of your aims and activities, like what's the project status? How's it going? Um, and then to find out, you know, are there, are there barriers or problems that you're having? Do you need help with them? Did you address them? What are the issues? And really to focus on kind of your research and the project overall, also on the Futurist tool and, and the database. So, you know, is there anything about using Futurist that you have suggestions about or that you had trouble with that we want to address and then also about your team itself and the team considerations i think that um a lot of this futurist work really requires teamwork and so part of what we want to learn here is are there things that we could be doing to help you know better enable the teams to work together um, and then lessons learned some you know brief activities or plans about what you're planning to do over the next month um, in your folders, in your team folders, I've actually added a question to this that just says, is there anything else that you wanna share? So, so the idea would be that every month when you meet as a team, either before you meet or during that team meeting, um, that you fill this out and just um, you know, keep it posted in your team folder so that everybody can kind of take a look at this, see where you're going. We can see if there are issues that might, um, uh, you know, be common across some of the teams that we need to address or provide some responses for. All right, so any any questions about, about this? Okay, and again, this is not intended to be like, you know, a 10 page essay. This is intended to be, you know, it's fine to have a set of bullet points about 
you know, what's gone on over the past month and, you know, just to kind of let everybody know what the, what, the, what your story is for your team. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go, I'm going to go to this link. And so this is what it looks like. It's just a Google doc. You can go ahead and, and, you know, use it um, however you want to. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, you know, let me stop sharing for a second and get my, I, I want to go in um, to, to the Futurist website and show you where these documents are for each of your team. So give me one second there to get that set up. Okay. All right, so I'm going to share my screen again. So if you get in to Futurist, click on workshops and go to the 2021 workshop. And then what you'll see here is projects. If you link on the projects, there's a list of each one of these. And if you click into the project, essentially what you have is this list of, of documents um, that you can use. So um, uh, I'll get to this, this spreadsheet piece in a minute, but this is, the, this is the form that I just talked about. So every month, you just make a new copy of it. You can leave it right here in this folder. And then any other information that your team is working on, feel free to leave that here as well. And there's a separate one of these for each one of the teams. Okay. Um, Um, Megan, this this conduct guidelines is this is this the blank document for them if they want to um, uh, create their uh, their ground rules or is this something different? I think that is something that possibly Danny made. Um, the things that I put in everyone's oh, okay. folder is the the spreadsheet, the workshop report, and the contact list. And then I encourage um, the project leaders to start adding some of their own stuff relevant for Perfect. the projects. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, that's great. Thanks. All right, let me um, let me go back to my slides here for just a second. I've got a couple more that I want to share. Okay. All right. So the other thing that we're going to ask you to do. So so this monthly report form is not something that you need to do today. The first one of these we would want you to to try to complete by the next meeting, which is September seventeenth. That's the next team meeting and you, you will likely meet in between, but that would be the next monthly meeting. All right, the other thing that we want you to do is to develop a team work plan. And, you know, I've got some definitions here. I, you know, I'll, I'll show you some examples, but essentially what you need to do is what works best for your team. What we want you to figure out is you know, for your project, what are the, the big picture things that you need to do? What are your, your main aims? And then within those aims, what are the objectives? How are you going to get there? Um, and then what are the activities specifically that people need to do to be able to accomplish that? Um, so I'm just going to, I've added a few things here. So you have a copy of this spreadsheet. It's nowhere near as sophisticated as what City did with all her data, but but I think this will be just fine for what we what we need. So essentially, what we're asking you to do is put in your project name, list your team members, and then lay out the aims that you want to accomplish. So so what I've made up here are just you know one is to get preliminary results within the project timeline, um, report those results. These are the three aims, and then work as a collaborative team to complete the project. Um, and then within those, you want to get more specific with specific objectives. For example, you know, this says add data to Futurist and then analyze the data. Um, under project results, you want to prepare a presentation for the December meeting and prepare a manuscript um, for the team, decide how the team will work together, assess progress and processes and address team concerns. These are really simple I, because I don't know the details of any of your projects. Um, my guess is that what you what you have in here would be more detailed than this. But the point is we want your big picture of the aims, we want the objectives for each aim that are going to get you there. And then on the next sheet, essentially what we have are specific activities. So you can, so these are the instructions, which we'll go through in a minute. 
And then um, the objectives, you can just copy and paste them here, number them, whatever. 